For over 40 years, Dr. Ken Dykewald has been recognized as the foremost visionary and original thinker regarding the lifestyle, financial, healthcare, and marketing implications of the longevity revolution. He is a psychologist, gerontologist, documentary filmmaker, entrepreneur, and best-selling author of 19 books. I'm going to invite you to take all the things you currently think about these subjects and just kind of put them to the side for a little while. Uh, allow me to kind of tell you a slightly different version of the story as it occurs to me. Now, look with me here at this chart of the average life expectancy over the past thousand years. And what I'm continually struck by is that up until around the 20th century, uh, most people didn't live very long lives. That living to 30 or 40 or 50 was considered a, a standard accomplishment. Now, there were some people who lived to 70 or 80 or 90, but they were very few. And so the life expectancy soared during the 20th century, up to, by the year 2020, 78.5. By the way, unfortunately, during these last few years of COVID, it has backtracked a bit to 77 on average. But there are many geroscientists who now tell us that because of impending breakthroughs, some of which I'm going to mention in a few minutes, uh, half of all the kids born this year may very well live past their 100th birthday. And there will be some of you watching this call uh, who are participating in various fields of science who may live to see your 150th birthday. Now, this is a chart of the average life expectancy at birth, not over the past 1,000 years, but over the past 100,000 years. Medical anthropologists now tell us that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy at birth was under 18. So what I want to say to you is that while we're tracking all sorts of other changes in the world, this longevity revolution has never happened before. Everything about it is new. Everything. Have we designed our automobiles to accommodate the needs and reaction response times of 80-year-olds? Have we designed our public lighting for the eyes of 70-year-olds? Have we designed our medical system for chronic degenerative diseases of people in their later years? Is our media reflective of the fact that we're living longer and longer lives, or is it still youth-driven? So we're in the midst of an extraordinary change, the arrival of longevity, something that was sought for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and we may not be done yet with the breakthroughs that we're going to see. This may surprise you, but two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. You know, Otto von Bismarck picked 65 to be the marker of old age in Germany in the 1880s when the life expectancy in Europe and the Americas was only 45. So what should old be today? And is the number 65 obsolete? I was taken 20 years ago uh, when John Glenn announced he was going to go back up into space at 77. In fact, I was asked by CNN if I would provide some commentary on this very extraordinary moment in, in kind of aging history. So I watched his first few interviews, and a lot of the young reporters were kind of poking at him. You know, don't you think you're a little old for this? And shouldn't you be puttering around the house? And what if you have to go to the potty? And what if your head blows up? And, and it was clear that they were not okay with the idea of a 77-year-old astronaut. But Glenn turned to these young reporters and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. What Glenn was suggesting was is that if you're in your 70s, you might have new dreams. Maybe you want to learn to play the piano. Maybe you want to start a church. Maybe you want to be an astronaut. Maybe you want to train for a triathlon. But longevity is not simply a matter of people living longer, but it's also the psychology of maturity that what we're seeing is kind of an awakening of the possibilities of life in one's later years. Now, on top of that, there's another force that's taking place. We had this quirky baby boom after the end of World War II. During the Depression and World War II, our birth rate hit an all-time low. 
historical low at that time. But then 92% of all women who could have kids did, and they had just under four kids. So here is the 1950s. Looking back, would have been a great time to be in the life insurance business or baby food or baby products. This is the way America and most of the developed nations of the world are changing. And this is the most predictable market force on earth. We've got to match health span to lifespan. Let me explain what I mean by this. If we think of life expectancy in terms of the average number of years that people are living, and the potential now is believed to be around 120, but due to breakthroughs I'm going to mention shortly, it could elevate higher than that. We in the United States, even though we spend more money per capita than any other country in the world, we are a very middling country with regard to longevity. Our life expectancy, as I mentioned, is now 77, and there are 33 countries in the world that live longer than we do. But possibly even more important, our health spans are not very high in this country. So what we've got is a situation where we're living a certain number of years, but we're having a long period of time in which we're aching, we're ill, we're experiencing cognitive decline, we can't walk, we're breaking bones, we're breathing with difficulty, our hearts are not working well. We have not created a wellness-oriented longevity. And that's a big mistake. So what happens as we age? We have more and more problems. So how do we envision healthy longevity? Can we imagine long-lived men and women, us, without illness? And can we build a scientific infrastructure, an ecosystem? And can we build a marketplace? And can we build a medical system that produces not only longevity, but a longevity where our health spans match our lifespans, a healthy longevity. So I'd like to tell you what I think the key elements might be on that path. First, we need medical excellence. This may surprise you, but we've got 126 medical schools in this country. There's only 16 full departments of geriatric medicine. And in the last five years, 85% of all the doctors and nurses will have graduated without taking one elective in geriatric medicine. That's unconscionable. Second, wellness and self-care. I think we need to ask what's possible. And I'm going to name the Betty White effect. I really took notice of Miss White when she passed away just short of 100, that people kind of rejoiced in her life. And people said, wow, that's what a 99-year-old could be. She was attractive, funny, witty, sharp, caring, loving, and she wasn't trying to be 40 years old or dye her hair to pretend she was 30. She was owning her age. And I think she set an example for a lot of people to say, wow, and I've got a picture in my mind of a 99-year-old who's a role model. So I also think we need what I'll call precision medicine, a wellness and self-care that's been turbocharged. Why should we have to wait once a year to get a handful of tests, which a lot of people don't even do? Why don't we know more about how to guide our health in a positive direction? And the model for that, I'd say, struck me a few years ago when Waze became popular. And I thought, this is amazing. Thanks to AI and GPS, you can decide you want to go somewhere. And that Waze technology, there's now Google Maps and other versions of it, will figure out the quickest, smartest way for you to get there, factoring in everything that might be going on between where you are now and where you're trying to go. I think we could all benefit from a health Waze. Why not build a model of the 110-year-old version of a healthy, vital, optimally performing me? and then have a device driven by AI help me make the right decisions. What exercise should I do? What time of day? What food should I be eating? How much sleep should I be getting? When should I be interacting with one specialist or my general practitioner? Or do I need to see an expert at one thing or another? Right now, we're kind of leaving it up to the individual and people have to figure out should it be Pilates or yoga? Should I do running or should I do rowing? Should I 
eat a keto diet or should I go on intermittent fasting? It's a madhouse out there. We need AI driven, a directional system so that each of us could be guided towards our healthiest version of ourselves. Fourth, man, do we need scientific breakthroughs. Once again, think iron lungs for polio and then the Salk and Sabin vaccines that led to a breakthrough that changed our lives. So are we committed to science? No, we are not. This is outrageous. It's shameful that we're not doing more. We need to substantially upgrade our scientific intelligence so that we can beat and maybe end some of the diseases of aging. What are some of the areas that I think are most promising? First of all, a universe of what's now being called geroscience has risen up in the last decade where there are now medications. For example, metformin is being talked about regularly and about 35 other drugs that are believed to have a favorable effect on the aging process and therefore strengthen the body's immune system so that the diseases of aging won't occur. And by the way, I will tell you that the billionaires among our population are identifying breakthrough drugs and geroscience, whether it's in Dubai, the Bahamas, Singapore, where can they go to find their own fountains of youth? But where I sit, we need to make these breakthroughs available for everyone. What else? I think we're beginning to see what will be a crisper future. The possibility of rewriting in an exponential way some of our genetic codes so that we can write cancer out of our future, so that we can write AFib out of our future, so that we can eliminate Alzheimer's from the human experience. Okay, so I became enchanted, uh, I guess I'm part of this call today, uh, by Focus Ultrasound this last year, and I thought, wait a minute. Building on the MRI infrastructure, you can aim targeted sound beams to the size of a cell or smaller and eliminate diseased tissue without damaging anything adjacent. It felt to me like a Star Trek episode. So a little bit about it for those of you that are unfamiliar. What's the principle? Multiple intersecting beams of ultrasound focused accurately to the submillimeter level. The beams pass through the body without damaging tissue. And this can have a profound effect at the targeted point of convergence. And focused ultrasound, since it emerged on the scene decades ago, in the last several years, is now being clinically tested for things like prostate cancer, breast cancer, Alzheimer's, fibroid tissue, Parkinson's. Another dimension of this, the use of what they refer to as micro bubbles, which are tiny bubbles, smaller than a blood cell. What's the idea of that? Well, if you can infuse the body with micro bubbles and then target the ultrasound beams to the exact locations so that the payload is released, you can conceivably cure diseases without damaging and toxidifying all the adjacent tissue in the entire body. Here's an example. Here's a gentleman with an essential tremor about to get a focused ultrasound treatment. This is the way he draws. This is the way his brain looks. Uh, he's awake. There's no incisions, no chemotherapy, no radiation, no blood clots, no blood da uh, brain damage. And this is what the man looks like after the treatments. I would have to tell you that as Focus Ultrasound progresses, and there's 59 manufacturers right now, I think the leading one, Incitec, many people from Incitec in Israel are on this call. If this progresses, it will render much of we, what we've gotten used to as chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery as barbaric techniques of the past. This could be a breakthrough we've all been dreaming of. Imagine being able to have cancerous tissue or damaged brain tissue repaired or removed without having to be treated with chemotherapies and surgeries and horrible radiation treatments. So where are we? We've got to learn to match our health span to our lifespan. And we've got some very profound changes to make to our healthcare system, 
to our wellness system, to our scientific community, and to the speed with which we make changes. So the time has come for a new era of health and healthcare. I'd like to see healthy longevity for everyone.